All right. Well, good morning, everyone. Yeah, that was kind of a fun little thing, right? So today is our, one of our family Sundays. We do this every fifth Sunday, and we do this intentionally. We have some of our elementary kids in here. One, we just want to give vision to our, this next generation, right? Why we do what we do, how we worship when we come together, taking the Lord's Supper together and singing and just studying God's Word together as a people so we can pass that on, as the Scripture says, to the next generation. That little clip was a clip from part of their curriculum that they do back in our kids' kids wing. So we just kind of want to sneak, sneak that in. And so today we're going to be wrapping up this series we've been in called Messy. We've talked a lot about relational messes. We've covered a lot of ground over the last several weeks, right? We talked about just carrying each other's burdens. And I've had a lot of props that I brought in. I had a kayak and how we each have our own load to carry. But sometimes when we're overloaded, we need other people around us to help us. We talked about being committed to making messes, right? Remember the four guys that brought their friend to a house and they busted through the roof of a house so they could get their friend who was paralyzed down in front of Jesus. And so we need to be mess makers and just doing whatever we can to get our friends to Jesus, being committed to making messes. And then we talked about cleaning up the mess, right? Remember the week, I'll grab my prop here. Remember the week we passed out the rags, right? And that we need to clean up the mess, there's a lot of messes that we make, and we're talking about relational messes and how we need to be committed to working through the hard work of forgiveness, right? Humbling ourselves and working through that because even as kids, I remember my brother and I growing up together, we fought a lot sometimes, boys, right? And get really messy and learning to forgive each other and working through those. I'm sure none of these kids ever do that with their siblings, right? They're perfect angels, right? I can see them see it in their eyes, yeah. And so, so we talked about, you know, just cleaning up the mess. And then we talked about pushing buttons, right? To be intentional, pushing other people's buttons. No, right? To how to not let other people push our buttons, how to respond the right way, right? So when someone pushes our buttons, we have those people that we respond in a Christ-like way. And then last week, what did we talk about last week? You guys remember what we talked about last week? The trash can, right? And how it's like one of those, all these things in life that's it's their responsibility, right? We just want to overlook all these things. And Jesus never overlooked the things that were overlooked, the people that were overlooked, and how we need to be. And so I got several text messages this week. One of them was a trash can opening up saying, thinking about you, Jim. <laughs> Thanks, Brent. Love you, brother. You know, so, and just being committed to those. So today, we're going to be talking, our topic today and wrapping it up is Armor All. Now, how many of you ever used Armor All? I've got some props here I'm going to play with. So I'm going to bring this old tire up on stage, and I just happen to have a bottle, a spray bottle of Armor All. Now, how many of you used Armor All before? On your vehicle, inside, on the, the vinyl dash. Your kids are like, I have no idea what Armor All is. Well, you will learn soon. All right. Now, I just want to just kind of let you guys know when it comes to Armor All, that if you're over 50, you really want to get this product because it says right here, it says prevents aging and cracking. So I would encourage all of you that are over 50 and up to get some Armor All. Right now, now, the kids may not understand what Armor All is for, but it's actually a protectant. Right? All these things we've covered in this series when it comes to our relationships, we need to do something to help protect all these hard things that we have to work through in our relationships that it just gets really messy. All right, now we use Armor All typically on, on automobiles, right? There's all different kinds of brand, you know, things that Armor All makes. And if you were going to go to a store and buy some Armor All and you saw a product that was half the price, but it said on it, Armor some, it kind of protects, it kind of helps. I mean, nobody would take, you know, a, a bottle of Armor All and just spray one little spot, you know, on, on their tire, right? I mean, if this tire represented your life, would you just put a little dab on one part of your life? No. If you're going to go buy some Armor All, you want to put it on the whole thing, right? You want to protect the whole thing. So we want to protect our whole Life, And so we're going to be talking about armor all today. And what we're talking about is the armor of God. We had our kids learn about the armor of God last week. So I'm going to set this back down here. That was just to represent our lives. We need the whole armor of God. And so what we're going to do here is it's Halloween. So we're going to have something spooky. No, not something spooky. We actually have an arm. 
a man of armor here that I'm just going to move up here. Thank you, Jen. Move up here on stage. All right. So we have this visual representation of the whole armor. Now I'm going to need some help here. I need a couple, some of our elementary kids to come up here to help me because I'm not really sure what's what here. And I'm going to read through Ephesians chapter 6. All right. As, we, as Paul talks about the armor of God. Now here's the thing. When you read through Ephesians chapter 6, you will find that it starts talking about relationships, believe it or not. The Bible's all about relationships, and God knows how hard it is and how messy it can be. And a matter of fact, because it's Family Sunday, what's interesting is that Paul starts talking to children, and he says, children, he starts off, I don't have it up on the screen, just the beginning of chapter 6, children, he says, obey your parents. As unto the Lord. This is a command with a promise from the Old Testament. We're to obey our parents. And I'm telling you, I was a kid once. And sometimes it's hard, right? When mom and dad says, go clean up your room. You're like, I don't want to. I want to go play or go do your homework. I hate homework, right? I don't want to do that. But we have to obey our parents because they're they're the ones that are protecting us. They know what's best for us. So he starts off talking, talking to kids. And then he addresses parents. And he says, parents, you've got a responsibility. And then he specifically addresses fathers. And he says, fathers, when you parent, don't push your kids' buttons. Right? Because we know what button pushing does. It just brings out the worst in us. And so he says, don't exasperate your children. And why does he address fathers? Because, man, sometimes we talk about, you know, women sometimes, they get their buttons pushed when it's relational stuff. But guys, it's when things don't work, right? We just go off. Right, And so for fathers, we got to be careful. And grandfathers, how we respond to our kids, to our grandkids. So this is all in this context. And then he talks about slaves and masters. And we can put that in a modern context of employers and employees. If you're an employer, you have workers that work under you. You're to treat them in a Christ-like way. If you work for somebody else, which most of us do, right, you're to respond to your boss in a Christ-like way and work those things. So it's all in the context of relationships. And then Paul, when he comes to the end of his letter, he says, now here's how you protect all this. Everything that we've talked about, here's how you protect it. You got to have some armor all. You got to put on the whole armor of God. So we can just have a couple of our elementary kids come up here. If you guys were here, you guys know how to label this thing? All right, come on up here. You can come on up here. All right, I need a couple of you. I got the labels right here with tape already on it. And you guys can show me what you learned in class. You can come up their steps over here or you can climb up either way. It doesn't matter. <laughs> just get up here. All right, so there's some labels here. Each one of you can pick up a label here. All right, so I'm going to read through this, and you can put them where they go, all right? So this is from Ephesians chapter 6. Paul writes this, A final word, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on all of God's armor so that you will be able to stand firm against the strategies of the devil. For he says, we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, right? We're not fighting against each other, all right? But we're, gonna, we're fighting against authorities in the unseen world, against the mighty powers in this dark world, and against all the spirits in the heavenly places. Kind of a spooky verse for Halloween, right? But Paul's telling us we're in a spiritual battle. Then he goes into the armor. You guys ready? He says, they're put on every piece of God's armor so you'll be able to resist the enemy in the time of evil. All right? Stand your ground by putting on the belt of truth. All right, where's the belt of truth at? You guys, I see I put a belt on there for you guys. All right, we got the belt of truth, all right, and then we got the body armor, all right, the breastplate of righteousness. Look at that. We got, you guys are awesome, all right? You guys got all the labels on there? Yep. All right, you guys can go back and sit down. I'm going to have a couple of you come up here just a little bit again. Yay. All right, let's make sure we, they, we did a good job. Look at us. Give them a hand. Look at that. See, I didn't even get to read it yet. They already knew where they went. This is what we're teaching them, helping them understand this, all right? So he says, here's the deal. You put on the belt of truth. So we have a belt there, the belt of truth, and we're going to get to all these. And then the body armor, which is the breastplate of righteousness. And then he goes on, he says, put it for shoes. We got the shoes of peace they label down there that comes from the good news. So you'll be fully prepared. In addition to all of these, hold up the shield of faith. They did a good job, got the shield of faith. 
that's here that will stop the fiery arrows of the devil and put on salvation as your helmet. So we got the helmet of salvation. And then it talks about the sword of the Spirit, um, which is the Word of God, and then to pray in the Spirit at all times. And be persistent, stay persistent in your prayers for all believers everywhere. Now the key in this passage that the Apostle Paul wants us to understand when it comes to putting on the whole armor of God, armor all, is that we are in a spiritual battle. There are forces in the unseen world that we tend to not think about. These, these evil forces, these evil spirits, we have an enemy against our souls who's going to do everything he can to steal and kill and destroy. And so what's important as Paul addresses this here, he doesn't say, just put a little dab on, right? You just don't want one little part. You want armor all. Right? You're gonna, that's gonna help you remember this, right? You want, you need the whole armor of God so that we can stand against the schemes and the strategies of the enemy because we are in a spiritual battle and we need the protectant of the armor of God when the battle comes. As we talked about this series, sometimes it gets really messy. We come to church, we all put on a smile, right? It's all fun. And then we get in the car. The kids are fighting in the back seat, right? And then you want to go one place, your spouse wants to go somewhere else, and in a short moment, all of a sudden, everything starts to unravel, and we get really messy sometimes, right? So we got to put on every day, we got to put on the whole armor of God. So what we're going to be looking at is why to put on all the armor of God. Why do we do this? Let's go back and look at verse 11. We're going to go back through this. In verse 11, Paul says this. He says, you put on all of God's armor, God's armor. Why? So that you will be able to stand firm against all. There's this word all. He juxtaposes these, these words all. You put on all of God's armor so you'll be able to stand against all the strategies of the enemy, the devil, of the devil. All right? So we have this, these evil forces against us. And he's constantly strategizing and scheming to help us stay messy in all of our relationships and never learning to work through our brokenness and the pain and the hard things that we, we go through. And so we need to put on all of God's armor. Matter of fact, I got some pictures here. Here is a picture of a Roman soldier. All right. So just to kind of let you know, this here is actually a medieval knight. But I'm just thankful that we have this illustration that the Hutton family let us borrow. But this is what a Roman soldier's armor would typically look like. We're going to go through this. All right, so they, they had to be very flexible and, and mobile. So the first one we're going to go through is the belt of truth that the Apostle Paul mentions in verse 14. And then when he mentions the belt of truth, he says, stand your ground putting on the belt of truth. We actually have a couple pictures of the belt of truth. This is what a Roman belt would look like. Okay, it was very different than what we might imagine. And then there's another picture here. Now here's the significance of the belt of truth. Paul references the belt first. Now, you don't put your belt on first when you get dressed, right? <laughs> but when it comes to the armor, the belt was the first part that they would put on because what's hard to see in this picture is the belt is what held the armor together. It's wrapped around the breastplate. It held it in place. And also the weapons that the Roman soldier would carry would be hanging. You would typically have a short dagger on one side and then a sword would hang on the other side. And you can see there next to his hand that the sword is hanging down there. And so this gave him the ability, once he put the belt around it, to hold everything together so he could be mobile and could move, very flexible, where if you were in a medieval knight armor, it'd be more like a robot, right, trying to move, right, very clunky, Right? All those little hinges would be squeaking. You'd be like the Tin Man and the Wizard of Oz. You'd have to need some oil. Right? It was just funny. You guys were supposed to laugh. You guys are boring. All right? So it'd be really clunky and stiff. And so we don't want to be clunky and stiff Christians. Right? So the Romans, so Paul's referencing the Romans' armor because it, was, it made them just be very flexible. And he's talking about the belt of truth. So he's referencing truth. God's truth is a protectant. God's truth protects us. And it's so important to understand that it's God's truth, not our version of truth. Right? It's God's truth, not our version of truth. And we live in a day where there's so much information. We live in the information age. Sometimes it's hard to sort through all of trying to make sense and what's really true. 
right? But I guarantee if you go on the internet, everything's true on the internet. Just kidding. <laughs> right? So it's not, it's not our idea of truth. It's God's truth. And that's the importance of, of, of the word of God, which we're going to come back to here in, in a moment. It's the importance of God's truth, not our idea of truth. And so this is what Paul states in verse 10. I want to come back to verse 10 where he says, here, I've got a final word for you. And he said, here's how you're going to stand strong. He says, you, you be strong, a final word, be strong in who? The Lord. In the Lord. And in whose strength? And his strength, right? So our, our tendency is to want to stand in our own strength. Oh, I can deal with this. I can handle this situation. And God, over and over again in the scripture says, don't rely on your own way of thinking. You lean on me. Trust in me. It's not your way. It's not your idea of truth. It's my truth. You need to gird and protect yourselves with the belt of truth. Truth is the foundation. That's why we put it on first. Truth is our foundation. When things get messy and things get hard, we need truth to be able to discern and think through and bring clarity to the mess, right? Not, not to overreact and respond, but we need the truth. Matter of fact, this is what Jesus said when he was with his disciples and he was getting ready to, to head into Jerusalem to go to the cross. And he told his disciples that he was going away and they started getting really nervous. Like, whoa, 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 Jesus, you can't leave. And we want to know where you're going. If you're going somewhere, we're going to go there with you. And this is how Jesus responded when Thomas said, where are you going, Jesus? This is what it says in John chapter 14, verse 6. Jesus told him, referring to Thomas, one of the disciples he was addressing, he said, I am the way, and what? The truth. the truth. Jesus said, this is the way. I am the way. I am the truth and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. There's lots of religions, lots of ideas floating around out there, but Jesus made it clear, I am the way. Not a way, the way. The Greek language is very clear. He is the way. He is the truth. He is an absolute. He is God the Son. He is the, the full word of God in human flesh, fully God and fully man. He is the truth. There is no other truth. He is the truth. And in him is life. And no one can get to heaven to the Father except through Jesus as the way and the truth and the life. And so this is our, our protectant, knowing that we have truth and our truth is wrapped around us. It's what holds us together. It holds the whole armor together. We've got to have truth. If we don't have truth, then everything else, when it comes to the armor, is going to fall apart. So that's why it's important we stay connected in our relationship with Jesus. And we come and we worship together. We have our kids learning about Jesus. And we come and just celebrate together as a people learning the truth of God's word. So the first thing is the belt. It's the thing that holds it together. The second thing, the second part of the body armor is, or the armor of God is what's called the breastplate of righteousness. Or in the New Living, it says, in the body armor of God's righteousness. It's referring to this whole upper part that helps guard our heart. It helps protect us. All right, and I got a picture here of the Roman soldier's um, breastplate that they would typically wear. Part of it covered the shoulders, and it kind of protected their whole back and their, the major organs of their body, and specifically the heart. And this is what the body armor of a Roman soldier would look like. Now, what's important for us to understand is that in that verse, it says that the body armor of God's righteousness, not our righteousness, not what we think is right, but in God's righteousness. And it's just remembering that our righteousness, where it comes from, that our righteousness comes from God. And in part, there's kind of a twofold thing when it comes to the breastplate of righteousness. Part of it is, is that when, when we're to, you know, Jesus said, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So if we're, we don't have the belt of truth around us, we're not living in the truth and walking in the truth, then what's going to come out of us is not going to be right. Okay, that's what righteousness is all about. It's being and doing what's right. It's not going to be right. So that's why we need the truth to hold the breastplate of righteousness so that when we respond, all right, when, when there's things coming against us and people are saying things, remember we learned that old phrase that's not true, sticks and stones, May break my bones, right? But words will never hurt me. We know that's not true. 
right? So, so we, have, we, have, we have to guard our hearts. So we have to understand that our righteousness comes from God. The only way that we can stand right before God is because we just took the Lord's Supper together because of the blood of Jesus Christ. And we stand on that. We stand on the, the armor of God, of God's righteousness. As a matter of fact, in 2 Corinthians 5.21, the Apostle Paul, as he wrote to a number of churches, one was his church in Corinth, he wrote this. He said, For God made Christ, who never sinned, to be the offering for our sin, so that we might be right, we could be made right with God through Christ. Another translation would say that we become the righteousness of God. And it's only through what Jesus has done for us. And that's why we always have a cross in our worship center set up here with a light on just as a reminder. It's because of what Jesus did on the cross for us that we can stand right before God. He's the one that makes us righteous. There's nothing that we can ever do to be good enough to go before a holy God. That's why Jesus came. And that's why he poured out his blood. That when we put our faith in him, we are made right before God because of the blood of Jesus. And we have his righteousness. So in the midst of the messiness and the spiritual warfare that's going on, we've got to put the belt of truth on. It's what holds together the breastplate of righteousness, holds our, our weapons and holds the armor together. And we have to understand that there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. We have the righteousness of God because of Jesus. So these are two pieces of the armor that help us to stand our ground. And the third one are the shoes of peace. The shoes of peace. Paul wrote this, verse 15, For shoes put on the peace that comes from the good news so that you will be fully prepared. And I've got another picture here of some Roman shoes. Now, I, I tried to find some copyright-free um, pictures. This doesn't really do justice to Roman shoes because Roman shoes were a lot like cleats. All right, they had several different versions. Some of them would have little studs on the bottom, and it was all about getting traction. And when it was really wet and messy conditions like we've had recently, right? They would have these long spike like nails sticking out of the bottom of their of these shoes that they would put on that would help them to get grip when they were going up terrain. They could just grip under the terrain and they could just be quick to move into action and have great traction because of these spiked shoes that they were, would wear. So when it comes to the shoes of peace, in order to have traction in our faith and to stand our ground against the, the strategies and the schemes of the enemy, we've, we've got to be sure-footed, right? And so nobody's going to go out barefoot unless you're going out in your backyard to play or something. Nobody's going to go out and walk through all the mess and nails and whatever's out on the road, right? You want to have some protection on your feet. And so Paul addresses here that it's the shoes of peace. That when we go and we interact with other people, we advance out of the good news of what Christ has done for us in peace. So let me just kind of put it this way. I've got just kind of a bullet point up here. When it comes to understanding that the peace, why Paul says the shoes of peace, because the peace of the good news of Christ, what we just talked about, his, what Jesus did on the cross for us, we can have, be right before God because of his sacrifice. The peace of the good news of Christ is what we stand on. We stand our ground. We stand on this because of what Christ has done for us and what we stand for so that we can be the righteousness of God and do what's right in our relationships and stay oriented towards the truth, right? So it's what we stand on, it's what we stand for, and it's what we advance with. That when people are pushing our buttons, people are, you know, kind of pestering us sometimes, right? Kids, you never pester a sibling, right? Stop doing that, right? We respond and we advance out of the good news of what Christ has done for us in peace. That's how we advance. We are called to be peacemakers, not annoyers and button pushers, right? We're called to be peacemakers. So we should always, always be prepared. Have your shoes. Always know the good news of what Christ has done for you. 
so that we advance and we move and we interact out of that, no matter what comes our way. It's part of the armor. And then the fourth part of the armor is the shield of faith. The shield of faith. And this is what it says here. It says, in addition to all of these, hold up the shield of faith to stop the fiery, fiery arrows of the devil. So the whole purpose of the shield is to protect. They would often take these, these archers, would have these, these arrows that they would shoot that have flames on them. And so these Roman soldiers, we've got a picture here of a Roman soldier, they had these long shields. And many times when, when things weren't going well, they needed someone else just to hold up the shield. Sometimes it would get heavy, so you need other people in your life to come around you, other friends, other believers to help you hold up the shield. And they would all get together and they would hold up these shields and make a complete protection guard against these flaming arrows that would come their way. Now here's the deal when it comes to the flaming arrows of the enemy is it understanding that your faith will be tested almost every day. Things may be going really smooth, right? There's these strategies and schemes of the enemy. He knows our weaknesses. He knows what pushes our buttons, and things can get really messy. And so Paul says we got to hold up the shield of faith. So I need, I need two volunteers to come up here to the kids. You come up. Paisley, you come up. I need you too. All right, I've got another way we're going to demonstrate the shield of faith here. I actually have a shield. Which one of you guys wants to hold the shield? All right, now you, you've, got a, you've got a block. There's actually a handle. Paisley, you can come around on this side over here. You get to have fun. <laughs> you know how to make that light up? All right, let's do a couple of them here. Let's get a couple of them going here. Shake it really good. We're going to create some, fiery. some fiery darts. You get to be the bad guy. You're never bad, though, right? No, that's good. Okay. <laughs> All right. So, so here's what happens. Here's what the enemy does. They just aren't lighting up very well, are they? Man, we got to break them up a little bit. Shake them, shake them, shake them. All right. Now, here's the thing. When it comes to the fiery, you can come, come center a little bit. You can back up a little bit here. Yes, yeah, so we can get you on camera so people at home. Now, here's the thing. Is it what would happen if you just set that down low? All right? And you didn't have the shield of faith up when it comes living out, walking out your faith. And you guys got into a little argument, right? And the enemy's just at work, and he's going to make you say some really bad things. Now, if she took this and threw them really hard at you, and you didn't have something to protect it, what would happen? I would either get hurt really bad or die. Yeah, you get hurt really bad. All right, so you got to put the shield of faith up, right? You're going to protect. The enemy's going to try to throw stuff at you. And sometimes it'll come through somebody saying something you know, we're doing something, right? So you, your job is to take one of those, you got the fiery dart, you throw it at him, and your job is to block it. Woo! All right, you got four more, three more. All right, you're doing good. Here comes the flaming arrows of the enemy. All right. All right, good job. Good job. You guys are awesome. Good job. Thank you, thank you. See, it's fun coming to church, right? You get to throw things. You get to break things. I'm just going to move those out of the way so I don't trip and hurt myself. Yeah. Now, it's a simple little illustration, and we can laugh, but we know when it really happens, it's really hard, yep. right? Because that little phrase, well, you can say whatever you want, sticks and stones, they, it hurts yep. when people say things. And I said last week, last couple of weeks, hurting people hurt people. And the enemy knows where we're weak. The enemy knows the things we struggle with. And sometimes we can get the best of each other. And so we've got to take up every part of the armor of God. And we've got to live out our faith and hold up our faith as a shield. This is what the writer of Hebrews wrote in Hebrews 11, verse 1. When it comes to faith, it says, Now faith is confidence. It's confidence. Confidence in what? In what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. So there may be this invisible spiritual war that's going on around us in the heavenly realms. We have an enemy, 
and fallen angels we know as demons that are doing everything they can to try to trip us up. The enemy will often whisper, we're going to talk about this in a moment, whisper in our ears, try to get us off our, off our game, right, and kind of get under our skin and get us mad. And he'll just take these little darts and he'll throw them. You'll make a mistake. You'll do something that you regret doing. And he'll just take that, that flaming arrow as it's kind of just piercing your heart. And he's just going to kind of work it around and say, look, you're really not that good. You're a failure. You're never going to amount to anything. He's just going to move that thing and it's just going to be killing you on the inside. This is why we put on the armor of God. Our faith is what gives us confidence that our God, He is true. He is the way. He is the truth. He is the life. I have this, this, this belt around me holding the truth of it all together. I've got the breastplate of righteousness. It doesn't matter if I fail. My God is my righteousness. It's what Jesus did for me, that I can stand right before God. Forgiveness is there for me when I go boldly before the throne of grace, as the writer of Hebrews also tells us. Right? So no matter how many arrows the enemy may throw our way, we have to take the shield of faith and hold it up against all those flaming darts to, to knock them away and say, no, I can stand with the shoes of peace and respond in peace with the good news of what I know my Savior has done for me. And we can stand our ground against the schemes of the enemy, knowing we have the confidence our God is for us. Our God is with us. Not some of the time, all the time. He is always there. And all of the angels' army, you know, the Lord's armies, the angel armies are on our side at war around us all the time, even when we're not even thinking about it. We are in a spiritual battle, and he wants us to live in the mess and stay in the mess. So we got to put on the whole armor of God, which brings us to the fifth thing, which is the helmet of salvation. He says, put on salvation as your helmet. Now i got a picture here of a Roman soldier here with a helmet on. Now, now think about it. Let me ask you this. How many times have you hit your head on something? Right? We've all hit our head on something, right? At some point in time, you, you, you're kind of reaching down under a table, right? And then, oh, you know, you bonk your head. It's like, Ugh. now here's the thing. Just about every time probably that you hit your head, it what? It hurts. There's not much meat up here. I mean, some of you may be a meathead, but there's just really not. Just kidding. There's not much meat up here, right? It's just really thin. There's no flabby stuff. It's, it's, so when we hit our head, It hurts. It hurts. And if a Roman soldier was going out to battle without his helmet on, and another Roman soldier sees him, and he's got all of his armor on, but he doesn't have his helmet on, you know what that other Roman soldier is going to say to him? <sighs> I'm glad you're in the front row, Mike. No, he's going to say, what are you thinking? Right? Because no Roman soldier would go out to battle without a helmet on. He said, what are you thinking? Why would he say, what are you thinking? Because the helmet of salvation protects our thoughts. We need to protect our thoughts. That's the number one way that the enemy comes against us. You go all the way back to the very beginning of the Bible, in the garden when God created everything and he created Adam and Eve in his image. They are image bearers of God. They reflect his very nature, his very character. They advance in peace. They are living in righteousness. They know the truth. They have all these things. They got this whole armor, and then the enemy comes, and he's got these little arrows that he's got, and he goes, hey, look here. Look at this. See how shiny that is? See this fruit on this tree? What, what did God tell you? Well, he said, don't go near it. Don't even, yeah, yeah, yeah. I know he said that, but he said that because he knows that if you eat it, you're going to become like him. They were already like him. And he takes God's word and he twists it. And he got them to take their eyes off of God and on that fruit to where they ate it. But the way that he did it was through their thoughts. And we see this throughout scripture. The enemy is always trying to attack our thoughts. Matter of fact, the apostle Paul, as he wrote to this church in Corinth another time in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, he talks about that we're in a spiritual battle, and the spiritual battle that we are in, we don't fight it the way we would normally fight in a worldly perspective. He says, rather, this is how we do it. He said, we demolish arguments 
and every pretension, pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we do what? We take every thought captive and do what with it? And make it to make it obedient to Christ. This is how we stand with the whole armor of God on. It's the helmet of our salvation, knowing what God has done for us through Christ. That we are saved in Christ. That he is coming back for us to bring the final salvation where we will be with him for all of eternity, right? So we stand knowing who we are in Christ, knowing our salvation, so that we can stand our ground against all the lies, all the schemes that the enemy would bring against us. We can't just put on a little bit of the armor you got to have the whole armor. It's armor all. It's what protects us against the, the schemes and the strategies of the enemy, knowing that Jesus is our salvation. And we have to guard not only our hearts, but protect our thoughts. And when the enemy tries to get our thoughts twisted, we take every thought captive and make it obedient to what is true, the belt of truth, our righteousness that comes from God. Our faith that we can stand in confident that our God is with us and for us. The helmet of our salvation, the, the shoes of peace, every part of the armor. And then Paul goes on to the next part of the armor. In verse 17, the last part of it says, And take the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. I can never, ever stop emphasizing the importance of the word of God. I think sometimes when we think of God's word, we think of it as something really small. Well, I'll just read this little thing. I want you to understand that the word of God is referred to as the sword of the spirit because it is not something small. And I'm telling you, when you hold this thing, man, you feel powerful. This thing's got some mass. You want me to test it out? <laughs> it's like, yeah. And when you have the Word of God in your arsenal, ready to go, it's our only offensive weapon, one of the offensive weapons. All the armor is defensive to protect us. The Word of God, the sword of the Spirit, we advance with. It is our offensive weapon because the enemy is going to try to bring all kinds of things against us. When you read Matthew chapter 4, the enemy shows up and he talks to Jesus out fasting and praying before he began his ministry. And Satan shows up, and he goes, dude, you're hungry. You've been out here for 40 days. Could you imagine, kids, 40 days not eating no. and praying? We're going to start that today, Mike. No. We're going to start fasting and praying as a church just because you said no. God's calling you that. I think it's a word just for you. <laughs> I mean, could you imagine fasting and praying for 40 days and 40 nights? You'd be really hungry, and it's hot over in the Middle East dusty, rocky, and hot, and, and Satan shows up, and he goes, hey, Jesus, dude, I know you're really hungry. Look at that rock right there. Doesn't that look like a nice loaf of bread? I mean, the sun's just warming it up. All you got to do is speak the word, and you've got the power. You can be self-sufficient. You can turn that stone into a loaf of bread, and mm, mm. some of you are hungry, ready for lunch, right? I mean, you can eat it right now. And what did Jesus do? He used the word of God as his offensive weapon right back at him. And he said, dude, man doesn't live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. You got to have the armor of God on. You got to know what's true. Jesus responded. He protected his thoughts knowing who he was in relationship with the Father and we need the word of God. It is a powerful weapon against the schemes of the enemy. And then to wrap this up, Paul says, here's the key to the whole thing. He says, pray. This isn't a last resort. It might be the last part in his final farewell in this letter. But this is the key in the midst of the spiritual battle. We have to have all the armor of God, the sword of the Spirit. He says, pray. Pray in the Spirit at all times and on every occasion because we are in a battle. And we got to pray and pray and pray. It is a part of who we are is what Paul is saying. That's why we do it all the time because it gets messy really quick, right? It gets messy really quick. Stay alert and be persistent in your prayers for all believers everywhere. 
we pray. And when we pray and we're on our knees, the battle isn't won out on the field. The battle is won on our knees before our God. And it's through that every day when we start off our day, we put on the whole armor. Not armor some, but it's armor all. We put on the whole armor our God and we pray for God's protection so that we can advance. And when things get messy, we can stand our ground against the strategies and the mess and the schemes of the enemies. Amen? Let's pray.